So, Roshan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're super busy and uh, I mean, the, the pandemic hasn't made work actually easier at all or the amount of work. Um, we do all work from home now, that's true. But to the more people I talk or try to talk, let's say, it seems like their amount of work has actually increased rather than decreased. Mm, Might yeah. has to do with the tools they have to use. Just a new environment they have, everyone needs to get used to, right? That's right. I think it fluctuates. It's fluctuated for me in any way. Yeah. So when it first first happened, I was completely overwhelmed, not least because the kids were at home. Right. And of course, I, and I didn't sort of draw a conclusion about having to cut down on any yeah. of the work. Yeah. That was, you know, it was possible to continue everything we do normally, just virtually. And then there was a month of just real nice sort of time where I could finally spend time with my kids, have a good reason. Yeah, and now I'm back to, I, I guess, you know, yeah, it's the kids are being right. taken care of and uh, it's okay. It's okay. I can spend a little bit more time thinking and writing and I suppose the meetings are a little bit more efficient. So, yeah. Um, that, that's good. Yeah, I don't I don't mind the the current situation. It'll be good if we we go back to seeing each other. Yeah, I think so too. Again, but it's yeah. a, but it uh, anyway. Uh, uh thanks for the invite. I'm really happy to make, give it some prior time. Well, I mean, um It's been quite some time since, I mean, the last time I, I've seen a talk of yours. And actually the first time I've seen you was when you gave the lecture in um, Neuroimaging 2 of the master's program with the hemodynamics. And uh, friends of mine have also been in your lab. So I, I, I have been familiar with what you, what you are studying and what your research is about. But I've been looking forward to this for a while. Because I always yeah. wanted to talk to you about what you're working on. Um, there was just never the time. Yeah, yeah. This is a great opportunity. Yes. Yeah. So this is, this is supposed to be about uh, the science of cognitive control and motivation. And I already asked a few friends of mine what they would see as cognitive control. And in mm. all honesty, they had no idea how to, <laughs> how to, how to, what, what that term entails. Could you uh, yeah. could you explain a bit what uh, what the cognitive control entails and how it leads yeah. with motivation? So so it is a really ill defined term actually, <clears throat> and in some sense it's a bit old fashioned. Uh, so it was introduced a few decades ago already, but <clears throat> I think it refers to that set of processes, mental processes, um, that allow us to obtain our goals um, by among other things, resisting distractions and impulses and temptations. So it's kind of an um, umbrella term um, to refer to things that happen between knowledge mm -hmm. and action. It bridges. It's the thing that allows us to bridge knowledge and action. And um, it's the funny thing is that having worked on this for, for so long doesn't really help to <laughs> to define it better. But then a friend of mine and colleague just wrote this fantastic book, really, um, on cognitive control. And it's for a lay audience, or, or I should say an, uh, an academic lay audience. So basically for students um, from any background, but with an interest, I suppose, in science. Mm -hmm. And he does such a fantastic job in 400 pages to... Um, to really also basically reactivate in me why it is so cool <laughs> to study cognitive control. And, um, and you're also asking about motivation, how it links to motivation. Yeah, right. But first, what, what, what is that book? Because the reader, the listeners most likely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, so I read it just before it's, um, so it's about to come out and it's called, uh, on task basically how we how we can stay on task and how we get things done yeah that's the title but um it's a it's a really uh sort of accessible book that's going to come out i think in a few months okay. so it's not it's not quite out yet and the author is david david badder 
Bader is B-A-D-R-E. Um, and he's, uh, he's a professor at, at Brown uh, University in right. Princeton. But I was I really, really so impressed by that book and um, and sort of contextualizing, sort of putting it in in the context of of various other uh, constructs of interest like motivation, like learning and um, episodic episodic memory and future mm-hmm. thinking and and all those kind of things that we might end up talking about today too. But right, uh, yeah. Oh wow, this is. Well, this would have been one of my last questions, actually, but it's great that you bring that up. Uh, I'm sure there are some other books as well, but uh, sorry for interrupting you. You wanted to also s- say how motivation links into cognitive control. Um, yeah, so given that uh, when we talk about cognitive control, we talk about the processes that allow us to obtain our goals, that already implies how important motivation is, right? How we kind of, what's the drive what motivates us to obtain our goals? And um, and so those two are really closely related and intertwined. And whereas, let's say, a few decades ago, uh, most researchers of cognitive control would focus on the question, how do we implement it? How do we implement control? So how do we resist distraction? How do we maintain our goals? And you know, our capacity to exert control. Mm -hmm. I would say in the last maybe five to seven years, people or five to eight years, people have started to shift their attention, not just to uh, how do we exert control, but how do we motivate ourselves to exert control? How do we decide? How do we decide whether it's worth our effort to exert control? So it's really sort of shifted attention to... um, uh, to the question of our willingness to exert control or decision making about whether or not to exert control, because mm-hmm. I think many failures, many failures of c- control arise, for example, in ADHD or in addiction, or they arise not just because we can't exert control, we cannot, but but because we do not assign value to exerting control. That's a slightly sort of different thing. Yeah. And it's not it's not laziness, but it's about this ability to to make uh make it the decision to focus and resist distraction. Is so it, I, is I guess possible, that's a mouthful. Right. Is it possible to frame it as in so cognitive control is more as in how to yeah, how to stay on task, how to allocate those resources and the motivation more like why do it in the first place? Yeah, so that's how I think about it. Yeah. And the uh, the motivational aspect in that sense is really related to what we sometimes refer as meta control. It's like yeah. the the sort of the layer above. The layer above exactly. It's uh, it's like how do we control whether to exert control in a sense? <laughs> how do, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's interesting. And how does you know but um my focus in my studies was always a bit more, you know, perception and motor control. And with the perception part, attention was also a big, uh, a big topic always. How is an attention uh, a factor in, in cognitive control? How is that oh, taken into account? Uh, very much so. Uh, so the whole literature on, on cognitive controls, I would say, intertwined with... Uh, with the literature on attention, selective attention, divided attention. In fact, many of our studies have um, have addressed this kind of dilemma that we exert all the time between uh, whether to focus or selectively attend to uh, some sort of information and ignore other information versus the, the this ability of divided attention to, you know, kind of broaden our attentional um, span or focus, widen our attentional focus. Mm -hmm. And there's this tension, right, between selective focus and divided attention. And how do we kind of balance those two uh, aspects of attention? I I guess cognitive control is really about controlling attention. Yeah. Yeah. And memory, so they're very intertwined. All those, all those concepts. Yeah, exactly. And it's yeah. uh, when I was talking to Alan, that was also uh, Alan Sanfi. 
Uh, this was also, I found that very interesting when he was talking about decision making, how basically the the memory, attention, and also then cognitive control played a huge role into what you are going to end up doing and yeah. and, and where in these processes things can, well, let me just say in air quotes, can go wrong, where you then on paper would make the the uh, you would you would make the decision that is not the best one but it's not really your fault because the machinery is not set up to be 100 percent perfectly rational it's just these heuristics being at play and then depending on how you or you as in as in how the situation is set up either tweaking the attention bit or tweaking the memory bit how that can well, how, how they can manipulate the outcome of the decision. I thought this was very fascinating. And yeah. uh, and how cognitive control plays into this was, yeah, I, I think is super important because it's, I mean, I think it's such an important part of our culture nowadays. And I think a lot of people might not even realize this, but what, what, what do you think? Do you think our culture puts a lot, maybe too much emphasis on the ability of perfect cognitive control. And what I mean is, I mean, you have all these self-help books, the you can do it mm. slogans and just just work hard and it's going to be fine. It, you're in charge. Mm -hmm. It's your control. Everything is under your control. Yeah. Do, do you think that that goes together? Yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised there is that, that emphasis. Uh, right now because of course the amount of information is so huge right we're sort of overwhelmed by messages all the time from yeah. i don't know how many apps <laughs> you know i can't keep up with <laughs> you know the, the app the app from my from the schools of my kids from the soccer club then from my rowing society and from i don't know this just it's 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 not so surprising to me that we feel this urge to um, to somehow control all this information and and remain focused on the task to be able to complete the task that we set ourselves to 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 obtain our goals. And I think the ability to direct our behavior at our goals is really key for getting anything done. Uh, but and I think this is what you're referring to. Um, it's only one side of the coin. Clearly, if we sort of uh, focus on one particular task the whole time, that comes at a cost. Mm. Uh, and there's many aspects to that cost of cognitive control. So one of them is that it's intrinsically costly. It's effortful, so it's tire tiresome. And the other one is, um, and one other aspect is that um, that it's opportunity costly. So if we, you know, for example, continue to talk in this meeting for too long, <laughs> then there's all kinds of missed opportunities, right? So we somehow have to strike a balance between um, continuing to focus on what we do now and to let go of that focus and flexibly switch or shift attention to things that at least we're not attending to right now that might turn out to be relevant in the future. Um, and this is what um, people refer to as the opportunity cost of cognitive control. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the question is, how do we sort of set the threshold to shift attention away from focusing on the current task? And I think this dilemma between focus and flexibility, uh, or another way to really refer to the same thing between selective attention and divided attention that's a sort of meta control challenge that that we've studied a lot in the in the lab that i'm really interested in because ultimately i think ad adaptive the ability to adapt our behavior it's not it doesn't depend only on our ability to focus and resist distraction but also on letting go of that focus at the right time if we don't let go and adapt flexibly then we're going to be suffering from too much cost, opportunity cost. The cost is going to be too high. And yeah, I mean, we can speculate about what that will do to our state of mind, but unlikely to be very healthy. Right. And I mean, I, I find it very interesting that you that you mentioned opportunity cost um, 
because it's in in a lot of you know computational models it's this is also taken into account as a type of uh, and then you have the different discounting factors as in how 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 much of time for the opportunity costs can you discount as in and then you know there are these the famous marshmallow experiments and all yeah, of those yeah, things yeah. where uh, how long can you hold out to to control yourself yeah and uh, th that i find that quite interesting and how how are are there specific mechanisms that in the brain already yeah d take care of uh, of this opportunity cost or they try to they try to account for it um there are some ideas out there and um um one of them has to do with um the dopamine system right. <laughs> so do dopamine of course has been uh, implicated perhaps most clearly in reward reward function reward anticipation reward prediction and one way to conceptualize of the opportunity cost to think of the opportunity cost is in terms of the uh, the number of rewards you might you might miss out on mm -hmm. it's so so in some theories, indeed, computational theories, the opportunity cost is equal to the average reward rate of the environment. Uh, so the higher the reward value of all alternative possibilities, alternative to the one that you, to the, uh, the, the, the action that you're engaged in right now, mm -hmm. the higher the cost of continuing to focus on the current task. So the higher the reward value of all alternative tasks, the higher the cost, the opportunity cost of the current task. Because the longer you focus on the current task, the more likely you are to miss out on obtaining reward for those other tasks. So you kind of have to make yourself do the, it's more like you have to force yourself to stay on, on that current task because there's so well, many potential other ones that could be more rewarding. Is, is, is yeah, this roughly I mean, it? I think the challenge is to sort of weigh up the, the the benefits of the current task against the benefits of alternative tasks. And what is the optimal choice, I think, depends on the benefit of the current task mm -hmm. um, in relation to the benefits that you might achieve from uh, shifting attention away from the current task to all possible uh, alternative tasks. Ah, to I allow see. at least all all other uh, opportunity for engaging in other tasks. Um, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's it's yeah. kind of you you for I mean it makes sense for this type of meta um, way of allocating those resources. You kind of have to know how much a different task would would get you or how, uh, yeah. as as in reward um, into the system. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's interesting, and, and that's a computational challenge, right? So it's unlikely that we, our brain, can compute the the sort of exact reward value of all alternative tasks. Clearly, that's kind of an untractable problem. Mm. Um, so one way that the brain might solve this is by uh, instead of working with the exact precise reward value of alternative tasks is to just accumulate reward over time and compute some kind of average reward rate um, and, 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 and compare the, the reward that you might get from your current action or your current task against sort of average reward that you've obtained in the past in this environment. Um, yeah. Right. And that's, that's where the memory comes in, right? Because, I mean, you have to keep track of it. Yeah, but then memory is a complicated concept too, right? There's multiple yeah. types of memory, of there's multiple course. systems of memory, where one of them is very explicit and declarative. And most people think of memory as this kind of thing where you, as episodic memory or maybe working memory when you have to remember or retrieve a phone number or something. It's very constant. But there's also a type of procedural or non-declarative memory, the kind of memory that we build when we're learning to ride a bike right. or the kind of memory when we, when we uh, learn that whenever you enter the bathroom, you, you raise your right hand in order to turn on the light. 
that kind of oh, memory yeah, is like ha- right. habit habit memory and yeah. so the question is and then there's, also, there's there's yet a third form of memory that's like maybe pavlovian memory where we've learned over the course probably of generations over the course of evolution Mm -hmm. that when you anticipate to get a reward it's adaptive to make an approach response that's also a form of memory it's just sort of innately pre-programmed memory Uh, and the question is whether that average reward rate accumulation that we're just referring to that might correspond to to an opportunity cost which type of memory that impacts? Is that the kind? Does that require the kind of declarative memory that, or or working memory that we we use when we remember a phone number, or is it the kind of memory that we build when we, similar to to the one that we build when we learn how to ride a bike mm. or press the right button when you enter your bathroom, or is it akin to the kind of memory uh, uh, that's more Pavlovian? That's kind of more yeah automatic i'm not really allowed to say that but it's more automatic yeah <laughs> right right but just my my gut feeling would say that it would make sense that it's depending on the task or or the situation that it's all of them right if you if you make a if you want to decide between something very uh, let's say abstract as in do i want to um write on my book or do i want to be interviewed for a podcast that that's then a very high level or if i want to uh, i don't know decide between a chocolate bar and uh, some gummy bears that can be some very very uh, sensory very low level yeah uh, but yeah, all of uh, them play a role all in of our them. decisions all of them and they interact and they trade off and they also work together sometimes so they can work synergistically to promote behavior or promote a decision when the two the three systems are in line for example yeah so when when the current context requires that you make a decision in order to maximize reward then the sort of innately pre-programmed pavlovian system um is congruent is going to tell you to do the same thing yeah yeah um, so I already have to apologize in advance. I might be jumping around between questions because everything you say, I immediately get an idea of what yeah, else to ask. Sure. <laughs> um, so you talked about the modeling before, and now you, you gave some examples of, of how this, how these um, cognitive models, let's say, can be, can be used to understand m- mechanisms in the brain, predict behavior. Um, but... Uh, it's been quite some time ago. I still remember I was in the car and I turned on the radio and you were interviewed on the radio at that moment. It was, it was, I was, I was, I couldn't believe it at that moment. It was just r- complete chance. And you were, oh. and you, you just uh, started your um, a professor position in, uh, um, I think, I hope I still get this right, neuropsychiatry. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the chair is called cognitive neuropsychiatry. Yeah. Cognitive neuropsychiatry. Exactly. And, what I thought was very interesting is how you were talking about these cognitive models and how trying to use that approach can help with um, with the DSM and how, how that relates. And, and just to, mm-hmm. oh, I wrote this down. I, I always forget. So the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. So now all the listeners also know what that stands for. And why I thought that was so interesting was when I heard about the DSM for the first time, and also, of course, that it goes through multiple iterations, it's, and please correct me if I get this wrong, I'm I'm not a psychiatrist, Um, it's kind of like a list of symptoms which then help you to categorize the, the mental disorder, but that still is very dependent on the, on the, um, doctor the psychiatrist making the assessment and i thought was very interesting is how you how you explain how these cognitive models can help with the diagnosis in a well let me say uh, a bit more number driven way quantitative quantitative way yes yeah um yeah 
So first, I should say, but maybe you finish your question. No, no, this is this is. Oh, it's finished. This do, is, it. do, is this, it, It's not really a question. It's, do I remember this correctly? And and, he, and this has been quite some time ago. So I have no idea how the field yeah. has developed since then. No, I think um, so. Um, so first, I should say I am not a psychiatrist, right? I'm a neuroscientist, cognitive neuroscientist, but I study mechanisms that might inform uh, our understanding of psychiatric uh, problems. Mm -hmm. And what I was referring to when I was referring to the DSM, it's the handbook that's used to indeed classify uh, people, um, yeah, pr helping them, helping um clinicians to make a, a diagnosis and make predictions for prognosis and that in turn guides treatment. Mm -hmm. um, the problem that uh, I guess the problem that I must have highlighted in that interview and that exists, it's a major problem in psychiatry and also neurology actually, is that there's huge variability in in the effect the efficacy the effect of treatment mm -hmm. so this is true in psychiatry but not, but also in neurology so for example in parkinson's disease right. um, which gets treated with dopaminergic drugs like l-dopa and mm -hmm. dopamine receptor agonists uh, they they work actually quite well for some motor symptoms but the effects on cognitive function are very variable. So some people will re respond well and, and the drugs will, for example, increase uh, cognitive um, flexibility. So it will remediate some of the mental rigidity that people with Parkinson's disease can, can exhibit. But that same medication, but first of all, it doesn't do that in all, in all people. So there's variability between individuals. Uh, but there's also variability between different behaviors. So that same medication that can uh, remedy this mental rigidity and motor rigidity that can actually contribute to um, some some uh, some some psychiatric problems in PD in Parkinson's disease, like med uh, addiction to the medication or gambling. Right. Mm. Uh, so people might develop gambling. hyper gambling. Even they might develop sort of pathological gambling. They might develop this what the, what people call punding this sort of stereotypical hobbying um, this form of compulsive behavior hypersexuality uh, so that's a really sort of salient example of of side effects of medication that is needed to treat some other symptoms and this um, this is very clear in the context of Parkinson's disease but we see the same thing in in, in ADHD schizophrenia huge and depression of course antidepressants mm -hmm. they work in some people they definitely work in some people but they also do not work at all and can have side effects serious side effects serious other side effects yeah so that's that's the major problem that that we um, that not just we but many people try and address and, and the observation is that the DSM doesn't really help. So in the sense that you might get a diagnosis of depression, and I think many psychiatrists will probably agree that a particular person will suffer from depression, um, so exhibit a particular combination of symptoms, and that's helpful. I mean, you need that kind of handbook and, yes. and classification for clinical purposes, also for insurance purposes, and, uh, and, and to have some kind of guidance of, of treatment. But it's just not predictive. It doesn't mm -hmm. predict whether a treatment will work. And I'm, I've talked about pharmacological treatment, but the same thing holds for cognitive treatment, behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy or other types of therapy. So that's the challenge that this field of I guess, computational psychiatry um, or cognitive psychiatry um, is hoping to address by beginning to identify what cognitive and neural brain mechanisms might predict drug efficacy. Um, so that's kind of over and above the diagnosis or irrespective of the diagnosis, which kind of behavioral or neural aspects uh, do predict whether someone will benefit or not from a drug. Um, and so we can begin with simple tests, computer tests, and identify some, or, yeah, quantify some kind of behavior like working memory or even eye blink rate. You know, eye blink rate right. is uh, seems to be predictive of, of dopamine in the brain. 
And really? Yeah, and we see we, what we see is that the amount of dopamine in the brain we can measure with PET predicts how ef- how how effective a dopamine drug is. Um, so for for the kind of anti Parkinson drugs like bromocriptine or Pramipexil or there's there's all kinds of um, or cabergoline. Uh, these are drugs that increase dopamine receptor stimulation. Sorry, that's a whole mouthful, but the kind of drugs <laughs> that help, help Parkinson, um, they increase this this brain substance dopamine. Uh, but what what it, what we see is that that drug works better in people with low levels of dopamine than in people with already optimized high levels of dopamine. Right. And and so what uh, what is uh, currently being thought is that we might be able to predict whether someone will benefit from a treatment, a dopamine treatment, if we know exactly how their dopamine system works at baseline before the drug. Yeah. Um, so and, you can then, dose appropriately if if yeah. it's going to do anything at all. Yeah, yeah. And, and so we see that now across the group. So we see across the group a correlation between how much dopamine someone has in their brain and how effective these drugs are. Uh, but but it, the next challenge clearly is w- whether we can sort of do this on an individual basis. And, and right. we're not there yet. So I just want to make that sort of warning right away. Uh, we're not there yet. But, uh, but there does seem to be this link between how much dopamine you have in your brain and how much, um, uh, how, yeah, how much effect you experience of a drug. Now, your question was about cognitive models <laughs> and, and computational models. And... Um, Uh, what what we think is that this kind of uh, dopamine can be approximated by um, by I would say behavioral or cognitive predictors. So we can measure using, for example, reward learning tasks or motivational tasks. Uh, that's a challenge, at least, of our current program to see whether using we can use or exploit or leverage those those cognitive models to get a proxy of of how much dopamine is in the brain so that we can ultimately predict a drug efficacy or treatment wow. efficacy yeah uh, that's that's sort of the the ultimate ambition of this of this program yeah so it, it's 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 almost like um, you first get the diagnosis using the DSM and then to get the treatment right you would try to have a specific battery of of, of tasks or let's say experiments ready to then see whether with a worked out cognitive model, how that applies to this this one patient and then kind of adjust accordingly. Because as you said, for some people, the dopamine treatment works, for some it doesn't. And this way you can already tell, okay, that there is a very high likelihood that additional dopamine is not going yeah. to do anything for this patient. We yeah. should go route B and not route, route A. Yeah. Yeah, and the obvious question you might ask is why not just measure dopamine directly in the brain? And 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 the answer to that is that's that's invasive. So a PET scan is required, which requires injection of a radioactive drug, mm. and it's also very expensive. I mean, so there'll never be a clinical application of PET to predict drug effects. So what we want is to build a sort of proxy model consisting of behavioral, cognitive, maybe physiological eye blink rate predictors. Yeah. And then then use machine learning to see how we can optimally combine these various kind of pragmatic variables mm-hmm. to account to account for as much of the variability in drug efficacy as possible. Right. Um, oh, yeah. Wow. And yeah. And so we're in the midst of this, right? So cr- right now we've sort of um, scanned with PET a hundred uh, volunteers and obtained every possible proxy measure you can think of, of dopamine. And we're sort of in the process of now combining them to see, uh, yeah, to work towards that proxy model. And these proxy measures include eye blink rate, how often you, you blink your eyes. Um, uh, also trait impulsivity, so personality measures. Mm-hmm. Um, the sample is too small to really say something about genetics so of course we can get dna but i think those contributions are going to be really small working memory capacity the ability to learn from reward um how sensitive you report yourself to be to reward versus punishment uh, but also how 
how you behave on a smartphone. So what we also see is um, if we, if we, um, this was actually done by a postdoc in my group, Andrew Westbrook, who's currently at Brown also. Mm. Um, but from the people who under underwent this dopamine PET scan, he also collected uh, smartphone use for a few weeks, and he was able to show a, a very reliable link between dopamine in the brain and um, how many times they clicked social apps on their smartphone. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So, and there's a really striking association. Of course, this needs replication and reproducing, but it suggests that that contributes to, you know, that we can get a handle of, of how efficient the dopamine system is by getting those more pragmatic measures yeah. from, behav from behavior. Yeah, exactly. Because I can imagine... You know, health insurances. Sure, they want to, they they want to help uh, people with their treatment, but they also want to be cost effective. And yeah. and PET scans are insanely expensive. Yeah. And and to make that part of uh, the treatment, I I I don't see it as feasible as something no. they would agree to. No, exactly. And also, I mean, it, you you wouldn't want to undergo it because of the radioactive load, right? That's um, also right. Yeah. Uh, one one PET scan is, I think, uh, it's totally safe. It's, uh, you know, there's very little risk to it. But still, I think people would prefer to not have to undergo it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's one thing to, uh, at least to me, uh, this is just a personal perception. It's one thing to um, uh, to get an X-ray, and but another thing to be told, uh, we're going to uh, inject you now with a radioactive substance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I, I rather have the X-ray. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so this holds not just for 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 people. Um, I guess so. The study we're doing now, one of the, the many of the studies we're doing now, focus on um, uh, very commonly used dopaminergic drugs like methylphenidate mm -hmm. and Ritalin, right, for ADHD. Right. Yeah. But the same principle that we just discussed holds of course for depression and antidepressants so um it's very unclear which person would benefit from let's say a dopaminergic antidepressant or a serotonergic and there's many different many different types of antidepressants i guess similar to the fact that there's many different types of antibiotics and uh, and and the, the problem is that with antidepressants you only know whether they work after a few weeks so you first have to sort of try them for a month And then only conclude based on subjective sort of ratings, does it work or not? It would be yeah. nice if we can quantify that and, and yeah. provide a bit more guidance uh, early on. Right. Yeah. And we all know how, yeah, I mean, introspection is not the most reliable variable you can measure. I mean, it's, 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 it's good to feel better, sure. Yeah, yeah. But you, it's, it's hard to also see a, a progression if things get better yeah although I, i have to say one thing yeah there is that of course this is though the subjective thing that is hard to measure is the thing that people go to the psychiatrist for that's fair. so yeah, so fair. so so the the quantitation of the problem is not the aim in itself that's cannot fair. be the aim in itself because the aim ultimately of psychiatry is to help people feel better yeah and that i think is the ultimate ultimate sort of um problem of neuroscience or the the the, the challenge i frame it more positively of neuroscience to to somehow <clears throat> help help us understand the basis and uh, the factors that contribute to this subjective experience yeah yeah and so just to make a link to something i i hear often um and i think this is Well, actually, before I say it, I'm, I'm curious on your take on it. So I often hear that, you know, curiosity-driven science is useless. Uh, it, 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 it gets very harsh. I mean, and nowadays media uh, environment, you, you hear oh, um, most of the time the extremes and nuances out the window. So I often hear, you know, curiosity-driven science is useless. We need application. We need application. We need application. Mm -hmm. And do you think, because the, the field of computational psychiatry is, in my mind, brand new. And do you think this is an example of why curiosity-driven science is actually not useless? Um, 
yeah so it's uh, so you're saying quite a lot i yeah. think it's 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 true that um um uh, there's a bit of shift of attention um i think um with people in general wanting to see kind of a justification of basic science i do think there is some nuance out there. So more and more um, people, also politicians are recognizing that the knowledge base is kind of key for any societal impact on the long term. So that we should make sure that also curiosity-driven science, basic science, fundamental science is funded sufficiently. So um so yeah, it's it's I I think it's a little bit more nuanced. I think computational psychiatry is a sort of nice in between example because on the one hand there is theoretically a promise of computational psychiatry to have impact on people's mental health, but I think we have to be really careful. Like the example I just gave of um, uh, of a proxy model. Um, ultimately predicting drug efficacy before we can apply that and actually use it in the clinic we're going to be you know many many years uh, ahead right i, I don't to make think, sure it works. I, don't, yeah, I don't think it's realistic i don't i don't think it's realistic that we're going to apply this like within the next 5 years and that is because because the problems people suffer from and because the are so multidimensional, they're so extremely complex. So maybe I can get a proxy model of dopamine, but that's not going to solve the subjective problem. Right. So we're, we're and, and it's like a huge problem, right? This relationship between the mind and the brain. So, um, and I think most people uh, in this um, budding field of computational psychiatry really are driven most researchers are driven to understand the mechanisms of psychiatric disorders, psychiatric abnormalities, and their treatment, and um, and so they're uh, and and to try and decompose this subjective experience into things that we can quantify, uh, with uh, with an ultimate aim to maybe advance mental health, but but not in the direct like we can't really promise anyone that we're gonna have some. Uh, delivery within the next three years, I think. I think that's not realistic. So for the actual practitioner, I mean. Right, right. Yeah, I Because mean, the, it's so complex. So, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it is very complex. And uh, it's not like you just develop some software that someone can use. This is really, this This has, this is impacting people's health. And there, yeah. there should be very, and there are very stringent rules on, on uh yeah. What is allowed, what is not allowed, and a battery of tests that have to be done with any type of treatment uh, have to be checked first before it just uh, gets gets pushed out as a as something yeah. new. And oh, this this works just fine. Exactly. Severe, you know, serious clinical trialing has to be done, and and you know we have to be careful also for the sort of abuse of these, right? Because yes. you don't you don't want anyone any sort of company or or whatever practitioner or anyone to go, well, let me just measure your smartphone use for the next three weeks and then I'll uh, sort of demonstrate that you will benefit from a cognitive enhancing drug. <laughs> and so it's e easy to also um, come up with a number of ethical challenges there. So we have to be quite careful to yeah. in implement this prematurely. Right, right. So you would say that Sure, the applied science is is important, but oh, yeah. curiosity driven comes first because it's if you if you think well, I'm I'm wondering if that is how you see it because it's uh, um, if you always think of the application at first, I don't know if that would if that would limit the exploration. Uh, if it would always go that direction, it would limit the exploration. But I'm very much in favor of this sort of dual route. So I, I don't mm. think the great innovations of today all follow a linear model where you mm. start with fundamental science and then we sort of the applications 
sort of <clears throat> magically appear. I do right. think it's a sort of two way interaction. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, 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 you know, you see a lot of, uh, emphasis on co-creation these days and I think that's very valuable uh, but I do think there's also value in pure fundamental science so uh, just a path sort of a path of a trajectory of science that's not <clears throat> taking into account possible applications um, but I don't think all innovations have to start with the fundamental science for sure I think there's many many examples of where you know, discovery is, is driven by the market or, yeah. Yeah. You know. the, the, the applicable problem first. And then of course, the problem, the challenge, the research uh, yeah. is done. Yeah. And it can be an economic one, uh, or, or, or a societal problem. Um, yeah. Right. And you know, you mentioned, you mentioned that you don't, wouldn't want companies to, you know, uh, use this type of proxy already to get your dopamine level out uh, to then maybe recommend you the right dosage of Ritalin, let's say, to be to have more cognitive control. Um, I'm curious what, what you think about the, and, and you mentioned social media um, directly. Wouldn't you say that is already happening, even though they might not directly measure your dopamine levels, but they, I mean, they're hijacking our cognitive control, aren't they? I mean, the more, the more you, I see lots of people going to the office and they have social media open all the time. Yeah. And, and then there's a ding and another ding <laughs> and it yeah. drives me crazy, but yeah, they get their, I mean, maybe this is abuse a little bit, but they get their reward hit. <laughs> and d don't you think those companies are already m making use of these types of ways to, uh, of, well, of, let's say, mechanisms of cognitive control and using that against people having cognitive control? Uh, let me think, try and understand what you're saying. So, um, Yeah, it's not just companies, right? It's, right? it's 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 our educational system. It's it's your neighbor. It's it's we uh, we leverage the reward system and rewards, whether they're social media or drugs or money or whatever short term. They they can hijack the cognitive control system. Yes. Uh, I guess the point we were making earlier is that this is not – we have to be a bit nuanced about this because it's sure. not always a bad thing. So, for example, imagine you're waiting for a train mm -hmm. and um, waiting or focus or is not always a good thing, right? Because if the train hasn't arrived in five minutes and then it hasn't arrived in 10 minutes and then it hasn't arrived in 15 minutes, at some point you need to give up control. Uh, so that's one example of – sort of how, where control is not adaptive or if you've sent me an email and I haven't replied in the, the same day and then I haven't replied the next day and then I haven't replied the day after that actually the longer I haven't replied the the more likely is that that I won't reply at all so waiting for my email is not really adaptive so in this the, the sort of the, the 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 narrow definition of control as waiting and resisting distraction resisting giving up persistence is is not always the best thing and that's that's exemplified by these train and waiting for email examples similarly there's a question of in our world where things change so fast there's so much information but that information flow is 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 fast and and also reflects uh the increase in uh the changeability of the world i mean it's a, it's a sort of vicious cir circle of course mm -hmm. because of the information things change but because the world is changing faster it might well be the case that it is actually more adaptive to be li a little bit less focused than we used to be 50 years ago mm -hmm. So that it's adaptive in order to to adapt flexibly to those fast changes that we do process a little more more information uh, in unpredictable messages. So we have to, I think, be nuanced about this and um, 
and and clearly in order to get anything done <laughs> we need to resist and pre-commit mm-hmm. and just turn off our, our social media but um, whether they are sort of bad in principle and whether the uh, tendency to um, provide information it's not in principle a bad thing of course right right yeah no no don't, i mean don't get me wrong i'm not uh, i'm not trying to to say oh all social yeah. media is bad because i don't think that's the yeah. case it's uh it also provides contact points for a lot of people uh, that are co- that are just using these platforms uh, as as a means of communication, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just sometimes you know I see I see they they make use of certain principles. For example, they um, where they take into account certain delays, uh, and and they know how that is going to impact your your behavior. Uh, they they use noise for the unpredictability to make sure your you don't your dopamine well let's still let that just say dopamine now <laughs> um, your reward response does not habituate uh, to the exact yeah. timing you know it's sim- similar to how in some ways slot machines are designed yeah 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 and video games and like vi- and these yes, and never video ending games. video games are of yes. course also uh, building on this uh this tendency to seek and to persist seeking and uh seeking reward uh and 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 they also but but i think video games are another really interesting example where they are very where interesting trigger trigger nuance because because the best video games um are those that maximize our sense of progress they don't necessarily maximize our sensitivity to reward or they Mm. don't maximize because if we we're not just driven by by maximizing reward right if we were driven by maximizing reward we would be most motivated by the tasks that are easiest because we get reward all the time Mm -hmm. but we're not We, we get really bored if we if we respond if we you know at the lowest level of the video game yeah. It's not interesting to get a reward and get points when we can do it. We're most motivated uh, when we make progress, when we change our ability, and when we. And, and I think that's a really interesting sort of domain, actually. And curiosity itself is also a function of that progress, uh, learning progress. Um, and in that sense, um, and you have to allow for the curiosity you know, as well, right? It's because yeah. it's, if you have too much cognitive control, there is no curiosity. <laughs> Uh, or maybe I'm mixing two things up. Focus. Yes. Yeah. I don't know yet. I don't okay. know. I think curiosity requires kind of a, uh, a, a dynamic balance between focus and flexibility. But yeah, yeah, maybe that's an orthogonal issue, an independent issue. So, but but I guess you're right that, so for example, these video game games are hijacking the motivational system in a quite an adaptive way. That is yes, yeah. and and that I find. I mean, I'm, I'm, I really like video games, but I have stayed away from from them on purpose because I know as soon as I start, I will have a very hard time to stop. And uh, I mean, the PhD didn't finish itself, and that that's why I, I didn't install any of them on my computer uh, because they are so good. They are so yeah. good. <laughs> yeah. And by now, yeah. with uh, I mean the. The expansion and the development of technology is uh, is insane, um, and and also when it comes to the game industry, it's expanding to to an insane degree. Yeah, and I think they are. And but you're right. I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing because we do hear a lot from using those principles from game design into other ways of. Um, you know, maybe uh, making learning and education more attractive. And then you have like these serious games uh, that are being investigated now, also by universities looking into this. Like, hey, can we That's maybe right. make That's... use of this? So this, it's, it doesn't, it's not all bad. Nay, no, definitely not. No, 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 no. Yeah. So what we, what we learn about cognitive control and motivation and the dopamine system, I think, yeah, can certainly be used both in the clinic, in psychiatry, maybe on the longer term, but also in AI and, and the game industry. And um, yeah, 
but in all cases, we have to be a bit uh, aware of the public values, I guess, uh, to say it in the general sort of of the ethics of it. Uh, yes. I mean, there also needs to be a meta level of how we need to reassess these things. Yeah? It's, yeah. It's, yeah. One thing is the application and then it needs to be how are we going to make use of it or yep. how it is being, how is it being abused? It's, yeah. And how can it be regulated? What kind of, yeah. what kind of rules do we need? I'm curious if that but, is going to happen. If it, some type of rules for, I don't know, um, methods of cognitive control hijacking or I, I I'd yeah. be curious how that would happen. Yeah, I think you know, there's this institute, the Rathenau Institute in the Netherlands, and I think all countries have an institute like that. In this case, it's a research institute. Well, it's also doing research, um, but it's a, an institute with the, the mission of the institute is to um, stimulate uh, public and political opinion on science, technology and innovation. Um, and and it's focused on exactly this, also on advising the government um, and the public on on issues of regulating uh, what comes out of science and technology innovation. So um, I was in the, on the board for that until very recently. It was very fascinating kind of domain that we don't often think about yeah, when we exactly. focus on understanding the brain and the consequences of that for many different sectors. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in all honesty, I, I would have never thought of these things uh, because you're just so focused on trying to to understand the mechanisms. And then you're so excited of, oh, I found another piece of the puzzle. And of course, yeah. plenty more questions popped up. But then, yeah, you, you move on to the next one. And then all of a sudden you hear somebody saying, oh, somebody uh, is thinking of using this for X and Y. I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that at um, all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that is our task, right? To also share the nuance, the, the sort of the complexity of it all. Uh, yeah, share the enthusiasm, but also the complexity. Yes, exactly. Um, I have a question that I wanted to ask for a while. And actually I get, I get asked this a lot. Uh -huh. And it's about, and as you, as you mentioned, um, dopamine, you, you mentioned Ritalin and also ADHD. I get asked about brain doping all the time. Oh, and, yeah. and, um, I mean, p people ask me, well, when do you think this will become the new normal? Mm. And, and I already tried to tell them like, we consume an insane amount of coffee doesn't, doesn't yeah. count this already as doping because yeah. it's a it's a drug and and i'm wondering you know is what what of all of these um cognitive enhancers is hype and what is actually real when it comes to their their levels of enhancement and you mentioned already that the levels of dopamine and and, and it also varies there a lot Yep. Um, I hear some people, my, my first experience actually with these things was, I never heard of these before until I was uh, in the United States on campus and they were talking about Adderall all the time. And I was yep. like, "What? what's Adderall? And they told me like, yeah. oh, it makes you very focused. And I was already skeptical. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean this makes you very focused? And then some people said, oh, this works great. Some people said this doesn't do anything. And uh, that, that's then the metal phenidate uh, component that you mentioned. And uh, rit yeah. rit Ritalin is the more popular version. Yeah, well, Adderall, Adderall is, works actually quite similar as atomoxetine. So it's also oh, the, the way it works in the brain is quite similar, but Adderall or atomoxetine yeah. uh, blocks primarily the noradrenaline re mm. reuptake, although it also has effects on dopamine in the cortex. Mm -hmm. And methyl phenidate, blocks primarily the dopamine transporter but also has effects on noradrenaline so actually their effects are quite similar apart right. from one thing so methylphenidate also acts on striatal dopamine the reward system oh. um, and and adderall has less of an effect on striatal dopamine but both act in the cortex to enhance focus this is true this is true but the degree to which it does this varies between individuals and depends on how much dopamine you have in the system. But it also very much depends on what task you want to complete. All right. So we, we've seen, for example, um, Sean Fallon, he was mm -hmm. a postdoc in my lab. He now yeah. is in the 
in the UK, but he he did uh, maybe you know I remember him. Oh, yeah, but, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah very funny actually it was great to have him around but he did this study with Ritalin with methylphenidate showing that it um, in in this particular sample of subjects it indeed enhanced focus but it impaired flexibility so he basically compared performance on two very similar working memory tasks and in one task um, people had to memorize some pictures and then they had to you know, these disappeared from the screen, so they had to keep them in their memory. And then some sort of distractors were presented, and these distractors, they had to ignore them. And then at the end of the trial, uh, another picture was presented, and they had to indicate for that picture whether that was one of the stimuli they had to remember originally, one of the pictures they had to remember originally. And what we find is that Ritalin really helps people just resist a distractor in the middle. So they do not get distracted. They get less distracted than people on placebo without Ritalin. But when he he did almost exactly the same task, but now the distractor was actually relevant. So they had to replace the original pictures with these new pictures. So now they had to flexibly switch, update their working memory Hmm. with these new pictures. And now Ritalin impaired performance. Because they couldn't, they were just too focused. Their 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 sort of memory representations were inflexible. They were too focused. So these are two sides of the same coin, right? And Ritalin in his hands really biased the state system towards more focus, less flexibility. So <laughs> the take home of this is that drugs like methylphenidate, they can help when you need to pay attention in class and you need to, you know, finish reading this book or study for your exam but if you need to sort of be able to respond and switch flexibly for example on outside of school or when interacting with people or being socially adaptive or something then it might not work so it really depends on what you what you need to do whether it helps or not oh that's interesting Uh, but but i would say in in a considerable proportion of people it does help we can show it helps um, it helps to focus and, and it helps concentration, um, uh, but not in other, not in everyone. <laughs> but do you and, think and, that, uh, yeah, sorry. The, yeah, the, I guess the, 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 the open question is whether, um, and that's something we're addressing now, is whether these drugs also help Meta control. Remember in the beginning of our conversation, we were talking about meta control and our ability yeah. to sort of adapt our cognitive system to the demands of the task. So be focused when we need to focus and be flexible when we need to be flexible. Clearly, this switches. Sometimes the world is really changeable. We need to be flexible. And sometimes the world requires us to finish our PhD, right? <laughs> to not right. be fo- flexible and respond right. to these, these messages all the time. And we need to switch between these states. We need to sometimes choose to be the one and the other and the question we're trying to address now is whether drugs like methylphenidate help with that meta control whether they help us adapt to the changes in the environment and that i don't know yet i think probably it might but That's we'll see and i think that is the key question right that is in the end what we need to do is identify what the world requires of us and then behave accordingly yeah yeah oh wow that's super interesting it's uh yeah what what people told me um back then in the states when they were uh w- were using Adderall for their focus they already told me how they are going about it and they said yeah I lock myself in my room I try to turn all other apps off my phone is off because they explained it does help you with focus but if your focus shifts onto something else, which which can happen, they mentioned, then you will be focused on that. And if that thing is not your studies, yeah, then then well, you're in a rabbit hole for eight hours straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I thought yeah. was quite funny. <laughs> it is really interesting, and I think it's it's going to be interesting to see whether these different drugs like Adderall or Ritalin uh, behave differently. Mm-hmm. in this sense. So maybe Adderall, which works ma- mainly in the cortex on noradrenaline, might really potentiate focus at the expense of flexibility. But maybe methylphenidate, because it acts on this striatal dopamine reward system, which is sensitive to what is the most 
relevant strategy, maybe that will help to adapt to to optimize meta control. So be focused when you need to be focused, but flexible when you need to be flexible. But we'll see. That's a hypothesis. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. super interesting. I'm uh, I'm already looking forward to our next conversation when you can tell us some more about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'll take a few years. I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, well, we can, well, we can have more until then. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I have a few more questions for you, and but these are more from you know people that work in the in in industry that that I often get asked uh, from about neuroscience and those things. But mm -hmm. you're clearly the cognitive control expert, so I just pass these questions along now to you. So one thing that happens in to people that I often interact now are are often uh, designers user experience designers, user interface designers. And um, one thing that they always say is that the experience needs to be very good. And you have these user experience books and guides out there that say things like, don't make me think. And you often hear this about um, Apple's uh, software being very intuitive. How does that how does that play together with cognitive control? Does that kind of really mean there is no cognitive control necessary in those moments if the user interface is done so well? Oh, um, or has nothing to do with each other? Let's see. So because because in these examples that you give or that are given to you, this this concerns applications. Yes, that require people to give me an example. So, for uh, example, they they want to make use of um, of of let's say a, a website. There's a web interface, and they have to yeah. they have to cr set something up. Maybe use this tool to, I don't know, do their video processing or things like this. And yeah, and 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 uh, a lot of companies put a lot of emphasis on trying to make these tools. Usable. As as yeah, of course usable, yeah. but but also not only visually appealing because you have these two extremes. One, you have the insanely technical part where it doesn't matter where the buttons are; you should be happy that they are somewhere, and <laughs> they're the 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 ones that think about um, it needs to look beautiful. But then they forget about this. Also, needs to serve a function, a purpose, and um, and what you often hear is how things should be made so people the users don't have to think through it they don't have to oh, search things they they immediately yeah. they they're like taken by the hand but not being told but by how it is set up yeah uh, yeah, so I think it does relate a little bit to uh, cognitive control and in particular the cost of cognitive control, which is effort, right? The sense of yes. effort. So what we see is that on average people avoid demand. They avoid mental demand. So so I think for um, for companies that want their websites or apps to be used, they want to keep their user engaged and they want to prevent them from disengaging disengage from the website. You know, if, if the user has to sort of engage in reading a set of instructions or, you know, trial and error, find out what's the what's the way to get to their goal, then they might long have sort of been distracted by a message from their soccer app or whatever. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So so minimizing cognitive effort. I recognize that and it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Although, although of course, there are going to be um, users who try and, what's the word, make a hobby of, of understanding websites and then they will be motivated by ex um, experiencing progress in, uh, in understanding the websites. But I think right. probably most people are not really driven to... I also don't think so. Unravel how websites work. No, yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, so if if there is a cognitive control element to it, is there maybe an easy way how how designers can can test for that rather than just it's being used and it's being not used? Is there is there a potential way of of a type of measure of our proxy that helps them identify okay, I'm I'm asking for too much uh, 
right now from the user. Mm -hmm. um, Could they use eye blinks? <laughs> oh yeah so what you're asking really is is there a proxy of engagement uh and arousal and i think engagement and uh so that's a really good question i think when we talk about engagement so so we've talked mostly about dopamine mm -hmm. but but i think there's multiple components to multiple neurochemical systems that contribute and i think noradrenaline the ingredient of Adderall really is also very important, and it's at it's it's noradrenaline that's most commonly associated with task engagement in the sense that's relevant here. So, and and a proxy, a common proxy of noradrenaline function is not so much eye blink rate, but rather um, pupil size. So. Um, so I think a pupil size would be an interesting proxy to consider there, where the larger the the pupil response, uh, the sustained pupil response, um, the uh, the greater the the task engagement. And and it's funny actually because we're 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 just in the middle of analyzing a data set where um, we're trying to disentangle um, two hypotheses of of the pupil size. One is that it's it's greater with greater engagement. And I think that's the that's that's a really salient hypothesis. Many people believe that. And the other is that it rather uh, predicts um, uh, error likelihood, how good you will be in a task, mm -hmm. uh, predicting sort of reward versus error likelihood. I guess. Uh, so it's funny because we're we're in the middle of doing that that study right now. Um, but anyway, I think for for uh, for answering your question, I think pupil size would be uh, the the primary candidate right. uh, for for assessing arousal engagement. Um, but it's still interesting that you mentioned that study. It, it, when you know what the result will be, or have have, yeah. have have some type of an indicator, I know a lot of people that would like to know about it. Yeah, because that I can I'm also happy. pass this on. Yeah, yeah, I'd be really happy to. Uh, something, sure. something else that I often also get asked is, in how how can people improve their cognitive control, even if they, if they don't want to take any drugs, yeah. how or or have access to them? Is there is there maybe a an in air quotes again, normal way that they can do this? A non non chemical way, you mean? Non chemical way, yes. yeah. Well, okay. So um, there's this, this, two, this answer, ties in, two answers. Yeah, this this also ties in with with um, I guess trying to get rid of bad habits uh, that yeah. I also often get asked about because I think okay, I just have to I just have to brute force my way into stopping doing this and then it's going to be fine. But that's not what's happening, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a complicated question, you know, it is, yes. <laughs> but, but there's multiple answers. One is that people, there's a whole literature on cognitive training. So where people have attempted to, or have, have assessed the, the, the degree to which, for example, training and working memory tasks for a uh, task for many weeks, uh, transfers to other uh, performance on other tasks because that's the key question, right? I mean, right? Many people have shown that if you train on a working memory task for many weeks, then of course, after like 10 weeks of training, you perform better on, on that specific working memory task. That's not so interesting. What's interesting is to see whether that sort of training will 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 transfer or generalize to other, other tasks and, and real life, preferably. Uh, there's little evidence for that, I should say, and that's possibly because the 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 right parameters of the training have not been identified yet. That's one answer. Uh, I do believe that it must be possible to expose people to um, controllable situations in order to bias them towards exerting control at the right moment. So what I, uh, but this is a hypothesis, so it's not been tested. There's not much empirical evidence for it uh, that way around. There is empirical evidence for this phenomenon of learned helplessness, that if people have been exposed in the past to 
uncontrollable situations, so situations where they were not able to exert control, hmm. then this generalizes and people fail to act, fail to exert control in situations where they can. This is a typical symptom of, park, of, of, of depression, depression yeah, yeah. learned helplessness. So given that we know that uncontrollable behavior, nay, uh, uh, sort of giving up in an uncontrollable situation transfers to controllable situation, I think we must be able to do the other way around. Expose people to controllable environments in order to motivate them to exert control, self-control in situations that are controllable. Do you see what I mean? I see what Does that you make mean. Sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's a bit of a theoretical point and I think it hasn't been uh, definitely not tested in a clinical trial situation or, uh, but I, I'd be really keen to, to look at that. And I think here yet another neuromodulator plays a role, namely serotonin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, yeah. No, this would, uh, this would, I mean, I can see how, and you're right, um, self, uh, learned help, not self-helplessness, <laughs> learned helplessness is really, um, it's a big part. It's a big, uh, part of, um, of depression and it unfortunately generalizes way too well. And, uh, yeah. and I agree it's, I mean, it, if it goes from one side of, uh, an, an, a situation that feels um, you have no impact on it, uh, to then that feeling into even situations where you can have an impact, but you think it just makes no difference. Mm. Um, the other way around, there should also be something. I, I, it can't just be a, a one way street. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'd be very curious. Yeah. How, how that would be possible. I mean, I, I hear and now the you have all the the hype with the meditation apps and, and meditation in general, where I hear people also say this helps them with uh, exerting more cognitive control when it matters because they. I mean, there are different types of meditation techniques, certainly, but when I um, the 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 mindfulness meditation, for example, I always uh, I, I hear often people saying, um, mentioning the experience of because they when their mind starts to wander and they notice they the 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 goal is to just bring it back not to be upset that the mind started to wander but just to bring it back and that is the practice and yep. uh, they they seem to benefit from that that having yeah. a, a clinical yeah. um trial for this would be very interesting yeah so esther esther arts in esther my, arts, uh, yeah. when when um well, she's independent she's a colleague here at the at the dccn yeah. but they, maybe you know her yeah i talked to her last week oh you did oh good yeah, yeah. okay well well she's done this this um really well controlled mindfulness work okay and uh, unlike many other studies she um looked at the effects of mindfulness training uh, in the context of a study where she also had a control training so people were so the effect that she found cannot be accounted for, for example, by increased attention or increased expectation because people, um, because of this really good control condition. And so she did find some, some interesting effects suggesting that mindfulness training can uh, potentiate uh, control. She didn't talk about that. Well, we, we talked about something else last week. It, it was uh, it was the MKB Cafe, uh, which which happened uh -huh. last week. But I still wanted to talk to her also about uh, about yeah. this this work that she has been doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and that was mindfulness in the context of food intake control. Oh right. So so cognitive control applied to uh, to food, and this was together with Lineke actually. So Lineke Janssen, you just mentioned yeah. before the interview that you know her. She she was the PhD student at the time, working with Esther, and and I was sort of peripherally involved. It was really Esther's Feni project. Yeah. Uh, at the time. Wow. Well, I'm looking yeah. forward to uh, hopefully having her on the podcast as well. Yeah, yeah, you should. She's great. Yeah. Yes. No, I'm very I'm very curious to learn more about that. Um, which, which pressing questions in your field, from your perspective, do you think still need to be investigated? And that, that should be really on the priority list at the moment. Yeah. So I think it's, it, it is very much the question I just touched on, which is this question of meta control. How do we decide when it's the right time to exert control and 
versus not exerting control and which mechanisms underlie that. So my strong hypothesis is that striatal dopamine has a key role in this kind of meta, meta decision about whether or not to exert control. And there's a number of meta parameters like the controllability of the environment, but also the volatility, so the changeability of the environment uh, that are coded and probably the cortex that in turn control these neuromodulatory systems. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in the top-down control of these neuromodulatory systems and then how we can influence it. So I, I just said how I I'm currently testing this idea that methylphenidate might might optimize meta control. If so, then that has clear implications for for cognitive enhancement and the potential of of cognitive enhancement. Right. Not ju not just with drugs, but also with training, because that yeah. means that optimized sort of um, meditation or or cognitive training should be focused on this meta control. So expose people to dynamic changes in the controllability of the of the environment or the volatility of the environment and then help them to adapt their strategy. Right. Um, and yeah. And they can also, I think this is, this is what's great is that it's, you're right. It's not only uh, on a pharmacological level, but also, um, and, and even not necessarily training, but you can also mm -hmm. have something in between where you then know, okay, I would be normally the, the models would tell me it'd be very susceptible to this. And right now I have to, finish the PhD or some other task, I should do X and Y, control my environment to optimize it for the task that I need yeah. to uh, or want to um, complete. And, yeah. and yeah. that being, being either something flexible or something very yeah. uh, focused. Yeah. I think that's, that's very, it's very exciting. And It's exciting and it also has some implications for how we perceive uh, certain neuropsychiatric disorders. So for example, if, 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 Uh, if we take this meta control seriously, then we might uh, reconceptualize problems like ADHD as sort of a normative adaptation to the way they perceive their environment. Yes. So maybe because they have been exposed to a very volatile environment, their, their environment is changeable. Yes. They perceive their environment as changeable. In that context, their distractible behavior is optimal. Distractible, flexible behavior is optimal if the world changes all the time. So that really also has, has implications for how we conceptualize of psychiatric di disorders. Yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, And, that makes um, sense. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting also from the sort of more um, kind of philosophical I guess, stoic perspective on life in general, that the, the key to success and happiness is to know whether to control and change stuff and whether you should just accept things the way they are. Yes. Let go of it. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, that's, it, you're right. That's a very stoic uh, approach, but it's, uh, it's, it's hard to follow. <laughs> yeah. It is. Well, it's hard to know. That's the challenge, right? It's yes. hard to know when, when things are changeable and when they're not. Yes, exactly. Changeable. And then um, act, act accordingly. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. That's then the next part. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, you already mentioned, uh, mentioned this book at the beginning um, from uh, David Batter. Um, but are there other, uh, other books out there which you would recommend to people who are interested in learning more that are maybe, maybe not too scientific or maybe too scientific uh, everything goes i i'm really i would i would be i would stick to this book by david although it hasn't been published yet but it'll <laughs> be published soon so i think people should keep an eye out and the reason i'm of course there's many many books huh that uh, and of course danny kahneman's two system right. books really interesting for many people and um there's this illusion of control uh, book which is also Uh, by Wakeman, I believe it's Wagner. Wagner, that's really interesting. Um, there's a whole bunch of books, but but you know, if I want the audience to the listener to take one book, then I would say, you know, wait for David's book, and then it's called On Task and How to Get Things Done. Yes, I would. Um, yeah. Okay, I will. I will highlight that one for sure. And. Um, You have to actually go or almost to your next meeting. And yes, well, yeah. I want to thank you so much for your time and, and this great conversation. I, uh, I learned a lot for sure. It was fun. 
and i uh, i i have uh, three more pages of questions i keep for next time okay great. <laughs> and you and you actually just added 10 more at least uh, just okay, during this okay. conversation i guess that's um, a good sign yes yes <laughs> yeah. and if if people want to want to find you or reach out to you uh where can they find you how can they how can they reach out <laughs> Um, I have an email address. They can email me, but right. uh, maybe maybe the the one other way is on on Twitter. On so Twitter? my okay han handle is Cools Control. All right, I will add that. <laughs> and, one. Uh, yeah, yeah. And my email address actually can also be found on my website. It's uh, roshancools.com. And the website. Okay, I will add all of that to the show notes so people don't have to write any of this down or need to uh, need a hard time finding it. It will be all right underneath. Well, Roshan, I can only say thanks again also for your time. And um, yeah, to everyone listening, have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much. Hey, everyone. Just one more thing before you go. I hope you enjoyed the show. And to stay up to date with future episodes and additional content we share, you can sign up to our blog and you'd get an email every Friday. Why Friday? Because it's almost weekend and we want to give a fun end of the week bonus that you can also talk about during your Friday afternoon drinks. It'll be a short email with our latest updates about bridging the gap between science and UX. The content we share ranges from conversations between UX and science, like we have on this podcast, our own journey from scientists turning into entrepreneurs, all the way to our own studies where we dig deeper into concepts of UX. If you want to receive that to stay in the loop, sign up at mind-trace.com slash blog. M-I-N-D minus T-R-A-C-E dot com slash blog.